But last week, uh, we talked about uh, the Gospels and uh, what the Gospel means and all of that. And uh, <clears throat> uh, one of the things we looked at was uh, the subject uh, of the Gospel, uh, the strategy involved, and the purpose. And uh, the purpose is what I wanted to kind of focus on. Uh, we ended up saying that the purpose uh, of the Gospel, uh, specifically John, but it applies to the other Gospels as well, is that we might believe and that by believing have life. Uh, and so uh, that is our uh, purpose of the Gospel. And this week, uh, <clears throat> I want to say that the rest of the Bible, while it has different strategy, they go about things differently, uh, different subject material. It's not all about Jesus. Uh, you know, Jesus is a New Testament uh, issue. Uh, but it has the same general purpose. Uh, so the entire Bible uh, is so that we might believe and that by believing have eternal life. And so that is our subject. Uh, but uh, I want to remind you or point out to you, if, if you didn't know, uh, the Bible... This clicker is extra sensitive today for some reason. Uh, the Bible's 66 books, it's actually a collection of books, it's not one book, um, were written by many different authors. And it was done so over more than 1,200 years. So it took a long time for the entire Bible uh, writings to be collected. Uh, it was written in different languages. So some of the earliest Bible was written in Hebrew. Uh, we've got part of it's written in Aramaic and partly Greek, and it's, it's just a, a, a collection of different languages under vastly different cultures. Uh, the culture of the early Hebrews, uh, very different from the, uh, from the Roman world in which the New Testament took place. Uh, and it was also written in many different genres. Uh, we have poetry, we have historical narratives, uh, we have uh, parables, we, you know, uh, we have uh, uh, lists of genealogies. Uh, it's just a, a lot of different kinds of literature. And yet, the entire Bible forms one cohesive narrative. It's, uh, it's, it's one big story, uh, sometimes called a meta-story, uh, because of the way it's all put together. And I believe that it's possible for a book that is written by many different authors over 1,200 years, uh, in different languages, under vastly different cultures, in many different genres, to form one cohesive narrative is because of two main reasons. The first one is that it's God-inspired. Uh, that is that uh, while all of these authors, uh, it was God speaking to their hearts and minds, giving them the inspiration, uh, I want you to write this down, and God putting it on their hearts and minds, what it was he wanted them to write down. Uh, and so uh, it's God-inspired. He was the, the force behind this. And it was only because it was God-inspired was this vastly different collection of writings able to be uh, one uh, big meta-story or one main narrative. Um, and then the second possible reason is the unity of purpose. And that is salvation. Uh, we talked about, you know, that you might believe and that by believing you might have eternal life. Uh, that's what we mean uh, when we talk about salvation, uh, that we might be saved. Um, because otherwise, uh, we're kind of lost. Well, and, and it's not just uh, my theory. I'm basing part of this, you know, on the scripture itself. So I want us to take just a, a couple minutes out to look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 10 to 16. If you're using one of our worship Bibles, page 964. 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, verses 10 to 16. Uh, in this uh, passage, this is uh, written by the Apostle Paul, who is writing it to Timothy. Uh, so Timothy is the receiver here, not the author. 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 16. Paul writing to Timothy. You, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, 
my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kinds of things happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, and the persecutions I endured. Yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Now there's some good news for you, huh? <laughs> While evildoers and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you have learned it. And how from infancy you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. All Scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And so what I want us to, to really draw out of that particular passage today um, is those two things that I talked about a moment ago. Uh, this is another passage that kind of tells us that uh, the Scripture is inspired. As, to, as Paul puts it to Timothy, he says, all scripture is God-breathed. Uh, that word inspired, if you kind of take it apart, um, uh, the inspired part is from the same uh, root from which we get like spirit. Uh, and they talk about like the breath of life. Uh, we talk about a person uh, uh, expiring, that, that, that idea of uh, you know, the, the, the inspiration is the in-breathing. Uh, and so when they say that, that God inspired the book, uh, we're saying that it's God-breathed. Uh, he kind of uh, put those thoughts uh, in a person's mind. Uh, now, one of the things we need to get away from is uh, the dictation theory. Uh, you know, God didn't just uh, dictate it to the authors. Mm -hmm. um, you know, he didn't tell Matthew... Um, you know, write these words and, and give them the word-for-word word thing. Uh, you know, write about this, write about that, and, and put it, you know, get it down. Um, and so what happens is that the author's personalities comes through, uh, even though it's the truth of God that they're conveying. And so Matthew, Mark, Luke, um, they will, you know, Matthew will, uh, will tell a story that, that uh, Luke doesn't. And Luke will tell a story that, that Mark doesn't tell. Um, but they're all telling the same story when you put it all together. Uh, it makes it kind of fascinating, actually. And then secondly, uh, the purpose uh, shows up in this passage from 2 Timothy, um, where he says, the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. That is, they teach you what you need to know to be saved. In other words, uh, that you might believe, and that by believing you might have eternal life. And so uh, Timothy uh, gives us those same two reasons uh, why the Bible is a cohesive book, uh, even though it was created under the circumstances which I've described a couple of times. Uh, now the Church of the Nazarene, uh, amongst other things, we have created as a denomination a, a list of our primary beliefs, and they're called the Articles of Faith. And Article of Faith number four is about God's Word. It's about the Holy Scripture. And so I want to read for you what the Church of the Nazarene says about the Word of God, or how we uh, make it our Article of Faith. We believe in the plenary, that means full or complete. We believe in the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures. By which we mean, uh, by which we understand, the 66 books of the Old and New Testaments given by divine inspiration, inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us in all things necessary to our salvation, so that whatever is not contained therein is not to be enjoined as an article of faith. And so the main parts that are important to us today. Uh, are those words uh, 
the plenary inspiration of the Holy Scriptures, given by divine inspiration. So we're, so we're talking about the source. Again, we believe that the Bible, uh, even though Paul wrote part of it to Timothy, uh, it was God inspiring Paul to write these words to Timothy. Uh, and kind of telling him what needed to be discussed and what needed to be talked about. And yet Paul's personality and his writing style comes through. Uh, Paul's writing is very different from Matthew's writing. Uh, <clears throat> so we see that. And then secondly, uh, the idea that it inerrantly revealing the will of God concerning us in all things necessary to our salvation. Uh, and so there's a lot of discussion. Uh, some of the different denominations think about the, the idea of inerrancy. And, and some of the churches say, uh, by inerrant, we mean it, it's without errors in every way, shape, or form. There's no grammatical errors. There's no geographical errors. There's, you know, there's nothing in it that's... Uh, that, and, and the church of Nazarene said, well, we don't really address that. Uh, what we want to say is that it is without error in meeting its purpose. Uh, it, it will not lead you astray. It will teach you what you need to know to be saved. Uh, it's about salvation. Uh, and so you'll, you, know, you even have Paul, uh, you know, you think if God were dictating it, you wouldn't have these kind of errors. If God is inspiring Paul. So Paul says, uh, I'm glad I didn't baptize anybody. And then a sentence or two later, he says, now that I think about it, I did baptize so-and-so. And, uh, I don't even remember if I baptized anybody else or not. But the point is, you know, it's like, well, you know, that's Paul's personality coming through. Uh, the idea that, you know, it's not him that's important. Uh, it's uh, in terms of, who, you know, so the people starting to brag about, well, I got baptized by Paul. Well, I got baptized by Apollo. So they were bragging about who baptized. And Paul was saying, that's not important. Uh, and that, that's what he was inspired to say. It's not important. Uh, so it came out his way. So that is uh, uh, the Church of the Nazarene stance. We kind of go along with uh, that idea that it's God's inspired word and that its purpose is to lead us to salvation. Uh, so what I want to do this morning is something I've not done before, uh, something a little different, uh, is I want to talk about the Bible's cover-to-cover -cover meta story. Uh, how, the, how the entire Bible fits together as, as part of the same unit. Because I know that, you know, growing up, uh, I was in church as much as any kid, uh, and I learned the Bible as well as any kid. And I got to college and realized that for the first time, when I was taking Bible classes in college level, uh, that some of these stories were coming together in ways I didn't know they came together. Um, and so I want to kind of cover... Uh, the Bible today uh, as uh, one story. And I, I want to point out that this is the, the Bible meditative according to Pastor. Uh, that has a couple of implications. Those implications are it's not a perfect version. Uh, and it's uh, it's going to have some flaws. Uh, and, and, you know, any other, you know, if Jim were to do the same thing I'm doing today, he would include some details that I'm leaving out, and he would probably skip some details that I'm tossing in. Uh, and it would be that way with any other pastor that, that did this today. Uh, there would be some differences. In fact, in my own mind, uh, after I got done kind of putting it together the way I wanted to put it together, maybe I should have this, maybe I shouldn't bother spending time on that. And, and so even making up my own mind was difficult. But uh, here's my version. Um, that we're going to do today. We begin with the book of Genesis, which kind of means the book of beginnings, uh, and that's where we start. The book of Genesis includes the creation narrative. It tells how God made everything and how we came to be, uh, including humanity, and then it very quickly moves into what we call the fall. Uh, and we don't mean autumn. Uh, we mean that uh, that that. Man was given choices, and early on, chapter 3 of Genesis, he chooses to sin. He chooses to be disobedient and go against what God had told him. Uh, and so that was kind of mankind's fall. We immediately have God's response 
in uh, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. That verse is called the Proto-Evangelium. Now, if you were here last week, you remember that Evangelium is the word for gospel. And its root meaning is the idea of the good news. And so we have the first good news. The first gospel occurs in Genesis 3.15, right after the fall, where God talks about how, well, in fact, I kind of want, I want to read Genesis 3.15 to you. Genesis 3.15 Jesus, uh, God is, is creating a, a prophecy or promise. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. And between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike at his heel. And most biblical scholars agree, uh, pretty much everyone agrees, that what he's talking about is that one of Eve's descendants, uh, Satan is going to attack, strike at his heel, but Jesus, the descendant, not named Jesus in this passage, but the descendant is going to crush his head. So there's a battle going on between good and evil, and it's going to, you know, the serpent uh, is going to be defeated by Eve's offspring someday. And so you have in that that vague prophecy uh, that didn't come true for many, many, many years, um, the, the first gospel, the proto-evangelium. Um, <clears throat> well, life moves on. Adam and Eve start having children. Uh, they start having children. They start having children. And within a few generations, God looks at the situation and makes the declaration that man's inclination is only evil all the time. Think about that. Within a few generations of creation and the fall of man, God says pretty much everybody is inclined to evil all the time. That, that's what they just want to do. Um, there was an exception. God looked around and said, well, there is this one guy, Noah. He's, he's living righteously as best he can, and he wants to. He's different from everybody else. So, you know what? I'm going to kind of start over. I'm just going to get rid of everybody, uh, all these evil inclined people, and, and start fresh with Noah. Uh, and so we have the story of Noah and the flood. Uh, and Noah is saved, and then they begin rebuilding the, the population once again. And then God called Abraham. So out of the few generations that are growing since Noah, uh, Abraham is born. And God says, I've got a plan that, you know, I'm going to send uh, the Savior in that I talked about in the Proto-Evangelium in that Genesis 3.15, uh, the seed of, of Eve. Uh, I need to prepare a place for that person. I need to prepare a, a, a people uh, to take care of him and to help him and to, to spread his word and to, you know, to be his workers and his followers. Uh, and so I'm going to take Abraham... And I'm going to start, uh, use, make his descendants my people. And I will teach them. And I will help them to understand. And I will get them ready and prepare them uh, to have my son born into them. Uh, and, and Abraham, his descendants would be a blessing to all the nations. Uh, and so Abraham had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob got his name changed to, to Israel. Uh, <clears throat> and had 12 sons. And those 12 sons were destined to be the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. And so there's going to be a whole nation from the descendants of Abraham through Isaac and then through Jacob, who got renamed Israel. Israel had 12 sons. One of those sons was named Joseph. And, uh, and they're in the place where God wants them. Um, but God says, uh, Joseph, uh, the other brothers get jealous, and they sell him into slavery and send him to the land of Egypt. Uh, in the land of Egypt, he rises in his slavery, um, gets to the point where he's second in command in all of Egypt, uh, only subject to the Pharaoh himself. His family, the other brothers that sold him into Egypt, they end up moving to Egypt to be with Joseph. And Joseph helps them survive this worldwide drought that's taking place. 
Uh, and there, they multiply and they multiply in what was originally these uh, 12 brothers. Uh, it's now an entire little nation living inside the borders of Egypt. And Egypt gets scared. Uh, what's going to happen? we got a nation living inside of us. Uh, to make sure that they don't cause trouble, we better enslave them. And so the Israelites are made slaves in the land of Egypt. And that brings us to the book of Exodus. In the book, and I'm not going to be this slow the whole time. <laughs> Genesis is really important. <laughs> in Exodus, Moses is born and becomes the leader that God calls to lead uh, Israel out of Egypt. So they're going to be freed from the slavery because of Moses' work, and they're going to leave Egypt and become a, a nation of their own. And so they do, they leave Egypt, um, and they leave for the promised land, the land that God had told Abraham way back, you, their, their family's going to come back someday. So they come back, uh, and, and uh, they, they sin. And so God says, well, you're not ready to go to the promised land yet. So they wander around the desert for 40 years, and during that time, um, God gives them the Ten Commandments and a lot of other laws. He begins to teach them how he wants them to live and what he wants them to do. Then we have the books of Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, in those books, God expands the law, gives them more and more details. Meanwhile, they continue to grow. They continue to be told about the promised land, and, and they make preparations to go there. Finally, Moses dies. His, uh, his protege, Joshua, takes over the book of Joshua. And there they, they conquer the promised land, and they take it over. Uh, and so now they're going to live there, and they begin to settle in. And uh, they don't have a very formal form of government. It's pretty informal. And God raises up what are called the judges. Uh, the judges include people like Samson and Gideon and uh, Deborah. And he uses these people for short periods of time to teach and lead the people and accomplish what he needs them to accomplish and to lead them to what he needs them to do. And everything is running smoothly. And then we have this book of Ruth, which is kind of a strange love story. Um, and, it, and it's kind of odd. It doesn't seem like it fits. And then you find out at the end of the book of Ruth that it's the story of King David's grandmother and how she got married and how and she had kids and then her son Jesse has David and so that's what you, you know where the King David comes from uh, he comes from Ruth uh, and then uh, they move into 1st and 2nd Samuel 1st and 2nd Kings 1st and 2nd Chronicles uh, in those books it describes the nation maturing and they decide they want a king they don't want to just have judges show up every now and then uh, they want a king and so uh, God gives them a king, doesn't want to, so that's what they want. I'm going to give them one. He gives them Saul. Saul turns out to be evil. And so then David arises, that we learned about in Ruth, uh, as their first good king. Uh, and he has the son Solomon. Solomon's another pretty good king. Uh, but then Solomon's sons begin to fight. Uh, the nation ends up splitting. Some follows one king, some follows another, and the country's in half. Then we get to Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther. Um, they kind of tell the story of uh, the nation being beaten by enemies and sent into exile, and these terrible things are happening. And then they kind of get to go back, and Nehemiah helps them uh, rebuild the walls. And, and so all of these things are happening, and that's part of the exile return. And then there's a section in the Bible... Joel, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Solomon's Song of Songs. Those are collected works of poetry and wisdom, kind of the cultural things that are taking place during these time of all of the kings and the exiles and all that. Uh, that is the stuff that the nation produced uh, that as God continued to teach them. And so like the book of Proverbs gives you all these important things about life and how to live and uh, uh, Ecclesiastes, uh, what is meaning of life without God involved, and, and you look at all of these kinds of things, uh, and so that's kind of the cultural treasures of the Hebrew people. 
uh, and then that era kind of comes to or not kind of comes to close, but it overlaps with the era of the prophets. And so you get to the book of Isaiah, uh, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you know, Daniel, all the way up through the book of Malachi. Uh, those prophets are really uh, kind of overlapping with the kings and the exiles, and and those are the messengers that. Um, <coughs> that God sent uh, to instruct, to warn, um, and, and uh, explain things, to encourage the people at times, uh, telling them that, you know, one of the days is going to be over, and you're going to go back to your land. And So he's got all of these prophecies, and of course more messages about the Proto-Evangelium, more messages about there's going to be a Messiah. And he's going to come and fix everything. And he's going to save the world. And so this all ends with Malachi. And so the Old Testament, three quarters of the Bible, comes to a close uh, with that. And then we have what's called the intertestamental period. Uh, it's not in the Bible. It's just a gap of about 400 years, a little over, between the Old Testament and the New Testament. But some important things happen during that time. Uh, that helps us make sense of the New Testament. And the, probably the most important thing that happened during that time is in uh, 63 B.C., um, the Roman Empire, under the leadership of General Pompey the Great, Pompey the Great, who happens to be the son-in-law of Julius Caesar, he conquers Israel and takes over the country, and they begin a long occupation of the land. In fact, in 40 B.C., 20 years later, uh, the Roman Senate the, does an official proclamation by vote, and they declare Herod the Great to be king of the Jews. So think about it. The Jews are God's people, and he's supposed to have his rulers in place. He wanted to be the ruler, and they wanted a king, and gave him one. Now their king's gone, and this Roman Senate declares Herod king of the Jews, which creates a problem at Jesus' birth because they're told that Jesus is the king of the Jews. And so now there's jealousy, and so Herod uh, you know, wants to kill all the, the babies because so, he doesn't want a king to be born, a king of the Jews, because he's king of the Jews, and so on and so forth. Which brings us to the Gospels, which I talked about last week. Uh, Jesus is born, he lives, he teaches, he performs the signs, that is all the miracles. He's arrested, crucified, resurrected, um, commissions his followers to continue to spread the word. And so we have the, uh, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all tell that story slightly differently, but it's the same story. And then we come to the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, the Great Commission is kind of repeated, where Jesus tells everyone to spread the word, you know, go out to all the nations and make disciples. Um, and he tells them, uh, in the Acts version of the Great Commission, to go to all of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. <clears throat> and then the rest of the book of Acts, Acts 2 to the end, is the carrying out of that commission. Uh, it's the story of them beginning to spread the word in Jerusalem, and then leaving Jerusalem to the rest of Judea and Samaria, and then eventually to the ends of the earth. you got Paul going to places like Ephesus and uh, you know, Thessal the Thessalonians and all, you know, Colossians. Uh, more on Colossians later. Uh, but, uh, so that's, that's the epistles. Um, they, uh, then we come to the epistles. That is the letter. So as those churches were planted, as people like Paul went to Ephesus and, and they did those kinds of things, churches were formed in each of those cities. And so then the epistles... As those churches are planted, as they begin to grow, uh, people like James, Peter, John, and Jude, uh, <clears throat> they wrote letters to those churches. Uh, and they are collected here in the section of the epistles. That is Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Uh, that's these early church leaders writing letters to these new churches that have been forming as the book of Acts is carrying out uh, the Great Commission, or the spreading of the word. Uh, these letters teach young Christians and young churches. Uh, uh, they, they broaden their understanding of all that has happened 
They explain the gospel and how the Old Testament saw fulfillment and, and all of that. Um, they deal with issues and questions that arise. Sometimes these young churches, well, what about this? What about that? And, uh, you know, they thought the second coming was coming immediately, and maybe it's not going to happen after all. And they're, oh, no, it's coming. It, you know, it's just not the timetable you expected, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they instruct them and encourage them as to how to live out their new faith. Uh, you know, how to love one another uh, and, and how to, what you're supposed to do for one another, all of that. And then the, the Bible ends with the book of Revelation, uh, which is, uh, the technical term is apocalyptic literature. Uh, it's a very special kind of literature um, where they use highly symbolic language, a lot of metaphors and, and symbolism uh, to reveal prophetic messages. Now remember, prophetic, we most often think of telling the future, uh, but it's actually also forthtelling. It's also proclaiming. Uh, and it's also, so it's about not only the future, but claiming God's will. So for example, in chapter 12, there's a story about the dragon who comes and tries to eat the baby that's born, but the baby is scurried away and is made safe. Uh, most scholars agree that this is the apocalyptic literature form of talking about Herod trying to kill the baby Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> the, the Roman government, represented by Herod, uh, he, he tries to kill all the babies in Bethlehem because he doesn't want a king to be there. Uh, but, but Jesus flees to Egypt and they're okay. That's, uh, that's what Revelation 12 is about. Uh, highly symbolic. Then in chapter 21, um, the author begins talking about the new heaven and the new earth. Uh, we're, we're moving into the future uh, and how that someday the righteous order will be restored forever uh, and all of the things are going to come together and, and all of God's people will be able to live with God permanently forever and all that. Uh, that comes together at the very end of Revelation as part of that uh, revealing of the book. And so there you have it, the Bible cover to cover, uh, it's one meta story uh, about God's purpose uh, for men uh, sinning and God uh, beginning a plan to save them and that plan coming to fulfillment in Jesus Christ uh, and someday uh, completely being known in the book of Revelation. <clears throat> so there we have it. Now, <clears throat> it is an oversimplification uh, but one of the things that we saw is that the Old Testament is all backstory for the Gospels. Uh, it leads up to the Gospels, and it, and it points toward the Gospels. And so it, it's connected. Uh, there would really be some things about the Gospels that you'd wonder about if you didn't know the Old Testament side of the story. Meanwhile, the New Testament, all of the things after the Gospels, is the elaboration, the explanation, the implications, and the applications of the gospel message. Uh, and so it's one big meta narrative. And the purpose of the whole Bible is that we might believe, and that by believing, have life. And by life, we mean eternal life. If that's not what the Bible is doing for you, then you're using it wrong. If you're, if you're using the Bible for other stuff, that might be useful, but you're missing the point. Uh, the Bible should be leading you to eternal life, to salvation. And that's how you need to understand it. That's its purpose. That's what it's supposed to be doing. Um, <clears throat> let's pray.